on the agenda. So welcome everyone to uh, let's see here. the uh, Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee meeting of Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. The time is 3.01. Uh, members, we're going to uh, get going and I'll just uh, uh, declare for the purpose of the minutes when a, a quorum is present. Many of these bills are going to be laid over, so um, the quorum, is, quorum issue is not an issue for a lot of these bills. But uh, we have 10 bills and so we just, we gotta get rolling here. So the time is 3.01. We are in uh, room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building and we will start with Senate file 4169, Senator Rasmussen. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about this bill today. Mr. Chair, I do have uh, the A1 author's amendment that perhaps can be considered later on in the committee today. We will, uh, yeah, as soon as uh, we have a quorum, we'll take up the A1. But for the purpose of presenting the bill, why don't you um, present it as if the A1 has been uh, adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you know, Mr. Chair and committee members know, CDL drivers are in high demand across the state. And Minnesota State um, has responded by expanding programs to help Minnesotans get their CDL and open the door to these high demand careers. M State, which is, uh, uh, has community colleges and technical colleges in the area I represent as an example, last year had 149 students go through their CDL program with a 90% pass rate, uh, getting these students into high demand and high paying jobs. One barrier uh, for these students and for these programs has been able to get testing for CDLs. Um, and it can sometimes take weeks or months for these students to get a test. Uh, state law allows uh, public higher education institutions to offer third-party testing, but it requires that the program consist of 180 instructional hours. Um, and the, the vast majority of Minnesota State campuses that have these CDL programs do not offer 180-hour programs. There's no federal or state requirement on the number of instructional hours, and so this, this rule sidelines M State and other institutions from being able to help Minnesotans get into these jobs and provide the third-party testing that's allowed in Minnesota law. The bill before the committee today would repeal this 180-hour requirement for specifically for public higher education institutions. All of the rigorous federal and state re uh, program requirements will still apply, and this will allow institutions like M State uh, to provide CDL testing for their students, which will help our public higher education institutions, help the students looking to get into these professions, and help the Minnesota economy have the workforce they need to be successful. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I have uh, two testifiers who would like to speak to the bill. Great, thank you. So I'll invite uh, Mr. Uh, Bateen forward and Mr. House Lawton forward. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself and then proceed. Thank you. My name is Craig Biteen. I'm honored to serve as the Vice President of Strategic Engagement at Minnesota State Community and Technical College. Um, today I stand before you in staunch support of Senate File 4169 and its counterpart House File 4004. These bills propose a directive to the Commissioner of Safety aimed at repealing the rule regarding hours of instruction requirement for post-secondary institutions offering commercial motor vehicle instruction. Under the current legislation, any post-secondary institution seeking to utilize third-party testing must adhere to the arbitrary 180-hour training mandate. By eliminating this requirement, our program would be eligible for third-party testing at our facility. It's noteworthy to note that four out of the 13 Minnesota State College's CDL programs currently have access to third-party testing due to restrictive 180-hour stipulations solely on post-secondary CDL programs. With only 26 examination stations across the state has proven insufficient to accommodate the approximately 10,000 individuals annually who are seeking a new Class A or Class B license let alone those who are seeking renewals. Since the transition to computerized appointments for CDL testing by the Department of Vehicle Services, educational institutions have encountered challenges in ensuring timely testing for their students, many having to drive hundreds of miles 
uh, often days or weeks after a student has completed training and tying up valuable equipment and personnel resources that could be used for additional training. The most pragmatic solution would be to grant post-secondary programs the authority to conduct testing on their premises. All Minnesota State CDL training programs are fully compliant with the FMCSA entry-level driver training regulations, emphasizing competency-based training without prescribing any number of training hours. The federal CDA, uh, CDL training standard delineates 53 learning objectives for a Class A CDL and 51 for Class B without any mention of requisite hours to fulfill these uh, objectives. Within our M State CDL training program, our online self-paced theory training typically spans between 20 or 30 hours to complete, contingent on individual progress, covering uh, over 33 learning objectives. Furthermore, our foundational range road training comprises 15 to 20 hours of personalized one-on-one -on -one training, encompassing a thorough review and guiding students through the road test. In the calendar year 2023 alone, M State Community and Technical College witnessed 149 students successfully completing the CDL road training with an impressive 90% pass rate on their initial attempts. These outcomes are a testament to our ability to deliver top tier instruction yielding exceptional results. Therefore, we fervently advocate for the elimination of the arbitrary 180 hour restriction enabling us to expand our program and meet the escalating workforce demands for commercial drivers licensed throughout our state. I would add our appreciation to Representative Keeler, Senators Rasmussen, Kupak, and Jasinski for their bipartisan support for this action. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Um, and I should just make a, a public announcement. Um, if if uh, testifiers could keep their comments to right around three minutes, less is even better. Um, we did the math, and if everyone takes their full three minutes, that's about over an hour of just testimony, and we have a two-hour hearing. So, uh, Mr. Hauslot, thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm John Hauslot, president of the Minnesota Trucking Association. I am also here today in support of Senate File 4169. According to the most recent data from the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, Minnesota faces a shortage of 3,651 truck drivers. And this mirrors the national shortage, which is just under 80,000 drivers. And this shortage is caused by a number of factors, including an aging workforce, changing lifestyle demands by that workforce, and especially for this bill, new federal requirements for training of truck drivers. As already noted, the ELDT, or entry-level driver training, created by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, establishes minimum training requirements for those seeking commercial driver's license. And I think this is the important part. The federal rule, rather than focusing on time, focuses on demonstrating both knowledge and competency. The belief is that the skills training should account for the skill level of the drivers entering the training program. So for example, some students, the backing component of a training may require three days of instruction and practice. Well, for another, it might just take a day. The same is true for each component. This flexibility focuses on where training is most needed and allows students with stronger skills to advance more quickly through the training. So the 180 hour training requirement in Minnesota rules is really an additional minimum time requirement that in many cases exceeds what a student truly needs. It also artificially increases the resources schools must allocate to truck driver training programs, ultimately driving up the cost. We believe that eliminating this 180 hour requirement will also make customized training programs, that's those not credit based, more able to compete for students and fill the growing need for skilled drivers. And as has been already noted, once these students are trained, they still face real delays in securing their CDL skills tests. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have reports of students waiting up to nine weeks to get a skills test. That's quite a burden when you've gone through the training, you've put your life on hold, you've completed, and now you want to get the credential, and you have to wait nine weeks. So we urge the legislature to address the need to make the skills test options more available and efficient, which this does. And so we believe that Senate File 4169 brings a common sense solution to part of the driver shortage problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hausladen. 
And you came in under three minutes. All right, love it. <laughs> um, so Senator, uh, two things. One is a quorum is present. Um, and with that, uh, Senator Jasinski, would you like to offer the A1? Thank you, Mr. Chair, so moved. Uh, Senator Jasinski offers the A1 amendment, an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Oh, and I should mention that uh, Senator Lang is joining us remotely from Fort, Fort Riley, Kansas. So hope you're having fun vacationing in Kansas, Senator Lang. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I don't think it's a vacation. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, I know he's serving our country, so thank you for your service, Senator Lang. Um, and with that, uh, Senator Rasmussen to the bill. Anything further? Happy to answer any questions, All right. Mr. Chair, from committee members. members. Oh, would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 4169? All right, members, questions uh, or comments or amendments? Senator Jasinski. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, and thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Again, I'm a co-author on this, so obviously I support it. I hear it day in, day out on the requirements and why the shortage is out there right now. We have a company that I'm affiliated with that is, is having a tough time getting truck drivers, and this time requirement is even exacerbating, making it worse. So I think a lot of things can be done on, as he said, demonstrate the knowledge and the skill and not just the hours, and I think that's the way things should be done. Uh, sometimes it takes people a lot shorter to learn things than others, and I think uh, it should be based on that, not on just a time requirement. So uh, thank you again, and thank you to the Trucking Association coming forward uh, with this bill. Uh, I think it's something that will get, uh, get us some, uh, uh, the, the delays uh, in, or shortened up so that we can have get these truck drivers back on the road and getting our goods and services uh, done across the state. So thank you. Great. And uh, anything further, members? Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rasmussen. I, uh, good bill. I, I think it's, uh, it's overdue to to reduce some of the restrictions and requirements we have out there for folks that are duly putting our stuff out on the road and getting our stuff to market, so thank you. Members, anything further? All right, uh, with that, um, with the amendments, um, which simply repeals the rule rather than the underlying bill, um, as I introduced, um, had a requirement for rulemaking um, means that uh, we think, we're pretty sure that this bill could just simply be laid over and then we can in include it in a future omnibus bill. Pretty sure about that. We find out something different, we'll bring it back up and send you on to state local veterans. Um, but for the meantime, uh, Senate file 4169 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you. All right, Senator McEwen. So this is the first members of one, two, three, seven bills that have to do with freight rail. It is Railroad Day in Transportation. <laughs> Senator McEwen. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members. Um, it's my honor today to bring forward before the committee for your consideration Senate File 4072, um, which deals with Yardmaster hours of service. So I, uh, this was and uh, is an education for me to learn about these different roles um, within our railroads. But a Yardmaster, for those that do, do not know, is an employee of the railroad who is in charge of trains, train crews, and inventory within a rail yard. Um, it's, this is different from when trains are traveling between destinations where a disp dispatching center and automated rail car readers take over. So this very important position, the Yardmaster coordinates all movements of locomotives, people, and equipment within the yard. This is not a simple task, as you can imagine, and can be very demanding. They act as a liaison between customers, railroad management, and railroad craft employees. Uh, you'll normally find them at a desk utilizing the two-way radio, phone, computer chat function, and email, often at the same time. Um, their role becomes very important in the event of an accident or incident in a rail yard. Um, in those instances, the yard master is the first point of contact. They relay information, direct first responders to where they're needed. Um, they also know where any hazardous materials are within the rail yard. They know where the employees are working. So the information that's happening, as you can imagine, is fluid and not um, captured necessarily by railroad data centers either. 
In spite of all this responsibility that yard masters hold, they do not have a limit on how long they can work each day. They frequently are forced to work 16 hour shifts, multiple days in a row. This is unheard of in an industry where 12 hours is the max for employees working in safety sensitive positions. There are no federal hours of service regulations covering yardmaster duties. Senate File 4072 closes this loophole left in federal hours of service regulations regarding yardmasters. And I ask uh, for your support. And with that, we um, do have some testifiers, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator McEwen. Um, maybe um, quickly, I think what we'll do, Ms. Boyd, didn't warn you about this, um, is after the uh, author presents, we'll just do a quick glance at uh, any fiscal notes that have, that have shown up in our packets to understand those, and then we'll go to testimony. Ms. Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, it, there's a fiscal note for Senate File 4072 showing a cost of approximately 5000 a year uh, for MnDOT, and that would be out of the Special Revenue Fund, the um, State Rail Safety Inspection Account in the Special Revenue Fund, which has a statutory appropriation to the commissioner, um, so no appropriation would be necessary uh, with this bill. And that $5,000 represents um, staff time uh, for state rail inspectors to monitor on-duty hours um, for the, uh, the staff costs, including fringe benefits, and they estimate about two hours per week, and that comes out to about $5,000 a year. Thank you. Uh, and so now we'll go to the testifiers list. Uh, we have uh, Nicholas Kadich from SMART and Amber Backus uh, from the Regional Railroads. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Dibble and committee members. My name is Nick Kadich, and I'm the Minnesota Legislative Director for SMART Transportation Division representing conductors, engineers, and yardmasters in Minnesota. Senate File 4072, Yardmaster Hours of Service, is a bill with minimum impact to railroad companies, but a large effect on our communities and workers. It would close a gap in hours of service regulation that's not addressed by federal law. Yardmasters are employees who control all aspects of a rail yard. They act as a liaison between railroad management, customers, and workers. They coordinate with first responders and are the point person in the event of an accident. As we've heard, they're very busy on the phone. They answer emails. They're on the railroad radio. They're texting. Uh, since train crews are not allowed to carry cell phones, the radio is their only way to communicate and it must be monitored at all times. So it's a busy and intense job. And as technology has advanced, the yardmasters have seen a change in duties, but not a reduction in workload. The responsibilities have grown to include more rail yards after railroad companies have consolidated territories and now yardmasters are in charge of more than one location at the same time. So we know how busy and stressful this job can be, but let's talk about the real risk to our state. Our communities and our cities are built around rail yards. They're at the heart of small towns like Waseca and Proctor and strung out through Minneapolis and St. Paul. Within these rail yards, you can find any commodity transported through our state, including the hazardous ones. In the event of any kind of accident or incident in a rail yard, the yardmaster directs the emergency response and communicates with all the people working in the rail yard to get everyone to safety. They alert the town or city to the danger, which could involve chlorine, anhydrous ammonia, or non-odorized propane, for example. When a yardmaster is working a regularly scheduled eight-hour shift, this isn't an issue for them. The problem and the driving force behind this bill is the yardmasters are being forced to work unplanned and unscheduled 16-hour shifts multiple days in a row. My members are telling me how concerned they are about their ability to react properly and do their job when fatigued like this. Staffing cuts by the railroad companies have put them in a position where they can't cover all the yardmaster shifts. If one person goes on vacation, attends a company meeting, or calls in sick, it can force this 16-hour scenario to play out. It's widely accepted in the transportation industry from planes to trucks to trains that 12 hours is the maximum anyone should work in a safety sensitive position. The requirements of this bill mirror the federal requirements of other similar railroad crafts. There are instances where yardmasters may perform duties that are covered uh, for another craft like train service or dispatching, 
But some railroads have banned this and kept their yardmasters stuck in this loophole of federal law so they can force them to work 16 hours or longer. This bill closes that loophole, capping the shift at 12 hours. Railroad collective bargaining agreements should not be a concern of this legislative body. As representatives of your communities, this is your chance to have a voice for how they are protected. You do not have a seat at the collective bargaining table, and legislating a standard that sets a cap on how many hours yardmasters can work is, uh, and still function in their jobs is within your authority. And this bill affects a small section of railroad employees, but has a very large impact on our communities, and I urge you to support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kadich. Ms. Backus, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus with United Strategies here on behalf of the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association. It's the trade association representing four class one and 14 regional and short line railroads who ship and deliver over 2 million carloads of commodities and goods safely and efficiently over 4,373 miles of track within the state of Minnesota. When Mr. Kadish brought this bill to our attention, each railroad checked internally as none had heard complaints about yardmaster schedules. In fact, several received the opposite reaction that the yardmasters appreciated the opportunity to earn extra income through optional overtime. And let me stress optional. And we agree these positions are important in running a railroad, but they are not directly involved in the movement of trains along the line, which is why current fe federal hours of service laws do not include them. The yardmaster is acting as a conduit, as you heard, working from an office and transferring directions and instructions from management to the employees on the ground. In many cases, yardmaster tasks are shared with multiple management employees, ensuring the efficient operations of our yards. However, if a yardmaster were to engage directly in an activity that involves the movement of a train during their shift, the federal hours of service would apply. But unlike ground service employees, the vast majority of yardmasters work a set shift with set days off, reducing fatigue concerns. Typically, these are eight-hour shifts, and the yardmaster works less hours in a month than are capped in the bill before you. But more importantly, I'd ask you to look at the data. An FRA study found 99.8% of all train accidents were attributable to personnel other than yardmasters, and of the 0.2% attributable to yardmasters, zero were proven to be related to fatigue. Imposing hours of service restrictions on all yardmasters engaged in all activities is impractical and unnecessary. Work schedules and hours of work are already addressed in current regulations and railroad collective bargaining agreements. This bill would not increase the safety or efficiency of our railroads. Instead, it would force railroads to hire excess people who would only be used intermittently, which is an, a special challenge in this tight labor market. And for these reasons, we'd ask you not to support the bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Backus. I have uh, Travis Osley from BNSF. Welcome to the committee, and please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Travis Owsley. I am a senior general attorney for BNSF Railway Company, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about Senate File 4072 and why we believe it may be unenforceable under federal law. Uh, for over a century, railroads have been subject to what the United States Supreme Court has described as one of the most pervasive and comprehensive of federal regulatory schemes. The body of federal law and the agencies that are charged with enforcing that law seek to establish national uniformity in regulation to promote a fluid national rail network. And courts have consistently held that a confusing patchwork of state and local laws would frustrate Congress's purpose and unreasonably burden interstate commerce. Here, hours of service for railroad employees are governed by the federal hours of service laws. And these statutes take a functional approach to determining who is subject to the laws. So in other words, uh, the laws look to the things that an employee does, not what their job title is, to determine whether the hours of service laws apply. Uh, when an employee is involved in, in moving a train or moving railroad equipment, or lining switches to facilitate the movement of equipment, they're performing train employee covered service and are covered by the hours of service laws. Uh, when an employee provides main track authority by radio or electronic transmission, they're covered under the dispatcher hours of service laws. Uh, we have yardmasters who do these things on our network, 
and they are covered by the hours of service laws. So we do not believe there, there is a loophole here or that the FRA has forgotten about yard masters. Uh, the FRA hours of service compliance manual specifically addresses uh, when yard masters are or are not working under the hours of service laws. Uh, the preemption provision of the Federal Railroad Safety Act provides that a state or local law cannot continue in force when it touches upon the same subject matter as a federal law regulation order or standard. Here there is a comprehensive body of law governing the subject matter of railroad employee hours of service. And for that reason, we believe Senate File 4072 will be preempted by federal law if enacted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Owsley. Um, is, is there anyone else who would like to testify on Senate File 4072? All right, we'll bring it back to the committee. Um, Senator Drzinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator McEwen, so can a railroad force employees to work? Can Senator, they Senator McKinnon. force them to work the overtime? Senator McKinnon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the question, Senator Jasinski. I think that um, the idea of whether an employee of in any um, different trade can be forced to work, I mean, um, technically, can they be literally physically forced to work? I think hopefully the answer to that is no, but there are certainly um, ways to coerce employees into working. It can be the culture of a workplace. It can be the sort of sense that you better you better not say no. Uh, you better you better not refuse this opportunity to do this. Um, anybody who's worked, I mean, if you, if you you've worked, I'm sure lots of jobs, Senator, as as have I, and uh, there's certainly a lot of pressure that can be brought to bear to have workers uh, work overtime. And Senator McEwen, feel free to invite your proponent forward if you would want to help responding to some of the questions. Yes, so. thank you. I, I would invite my um, my supporting testifier. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Um, Senator Drzinski, follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Well, just going along those lines, so I was in the military and I controlled F-14s, A-6s, A-7s, helicopters, and we many times had to work more than 12 hours. Uh, but we basically said if we couldn't do it, we you know, couldn't do it, and we were, felt like we were overwhelmed or we deprived of sleep. And, and uh, I'm also involved in a construction company, and I'll tell you what, our employees beg to work overtime because they want the money. Uh, and I think if they feel like they can't do it, there's no pressure, they just decide, you know, if I want the hours, I'd like to work. I've never seen in any environment where someone feels like they're forced to work. I see it's the, you know, just their own choice. They'd like to work overtime to get overtime hours. and. And from military to construction, I, you know, I see this is just a personal preference. They want the overtime, so they work the overtime. And I, you know, I, I think it's up to their employees' choice. If they want to work hard to make more money, they should be able to. And, and I think we're just impeding business by doing this. And, and I think if someone feels overwhelmed from a safety standpoint, they can't do it, they're going to say they don't want to work the overtime. And, and again, I've never seen anyone forced. And we have many, many people at our construction company that do or don't want to work overtime, and that's their choice. And I think we're taking that choice away at this point uh, with this bill. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Jasinski. All right, members, any further questions? Uh, Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator McEwen, is it, it going down that line, can yard masters just work unlimited hours then, or are they limited to the number of hours? Are they? You know, that mandatory overtime, I guess, is a big question for me. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Howe. I'm, I'm going to defer to my expert here to answer that question. Mr. Kadich. Thank you, Chair Dibble and, and Senator Howe. Uh, the railroad industry, I hate to use the word unique because everybody has their own, uh, their own niche, right? But with the railroad industry, once you show up to work as an employee, you're essentially their captive. Um, you are going to work there until you are released from your duty um, under penalty of, of discipline or losing your job. And that is the nature of the railroad industry. Um, this hits me particularly hard. There's a lot of shifts that uh, I've been forced to work over and I've missed things for my children. Mm -hmm. um, so no, it's not optional. I would, uh, and, and I will say there is, of course, one option that a, a railroad employee would have, and that is to come in on the rest day voluntarily. Uh, that would be voluntary overtime that they could seek. But however, once you show up for your shift, 
uh, you are there until released by the company. Senator Howell, could we hear from the Railroad Association on that? Certainly. Ms. Backus, did you want to respond? Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Chair and uh, Senator Howe. Appreciate the question, and we would beg to differ completely with that characterization. And I, I apologize if, if that has happened to you and that was your impression, but I've asked that question a million times of my clients, and, and that has not been the answer I've gotten that you're captive. If you don't want to work, then you have the ability to go. And so. Thank you. All right, members, anything further? All right, with that, um, we will lay Senate file 4072 over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Senator much. McKeown. So now we start, uh, we start Kupik day here. Uh, Senator Kupik, uh, Please come forward and we'll start, we'll just take these bills in the order in which they're listed, unless you really feel strongly that there should be a different order. We have first up Senate file 3639. Sure, no, I love this order. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I appreciate the Kupec day. I, I would like more of those, thanks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not in front of your committee constantly, but sure. <laughs> I, well, uh, um, well, no offense, always this committee, Yes, well, judiciary. there was a parade Sorry. out front for you <laughs> earlier. I don't know if you saw that. Sure. All right, All right so uh, first here, uh, the first the first train to leave the station on my docket here is... Oh, Senate no, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you knew this was coming. You're, it's you're gaveled out. Day. <laughs> this is how I operate. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. You're out of order. All right. All right. Go ahead. Back to work. Senate file uh, 3639. This is... Uh, uh, a little bit of a cleanup from a bill we had last year uh, that uh, indicated how uh, railroads were supposed to respond if there was an incident. And one of the things that was in there was that it said that they had to contact the local fire chief. And then afterwards, with consultation with the fire marshal's department, um, that, that may be a little bit of a somewhat of a difficult day, say the fire chief was off on vacation. Um, so what this bill does is this goes through and says that the equivalent of that is if you, if there's an incident and they dial 911 and that puts them in touch with the fire department, that is an acceptable uh, way to go. So it is, it's just a clean up on that language. And I do have a testifier if you'd like. Thank you. Yes, I think um, <laughs> this is one of our uh, easier Bills, I hope. Uh, it's an agency bill. We have uh, Mr. Cunningham here from the Department of Public Safety. Um, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the committee, uh, good afternoon. My name is John Cunningham. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Emergency Services for the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Uh, prior to joining the agency uh, in March of last year, I spent over 25 years in the fire service, most re recently as a fire chief here in Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Senator, uh, for authoring this bill. Uh, this bill, uh, Senate File 3639, aims to create a more efficient pathway of notification to local emergency managers and the fire departments um, when a rail incident occurs uh, in their jurisdiction. Routing notifications to the local Public Safety Answering Point, or PSAP, uh, fits within standard practices across the state. Uh, this essentially means that the rail companies will contact the 911 dispatch center directly. Uh, from there, the local PSAP will then route the notifications to the emergency manager uh, or to the fire department having jurisdiction in that area. Uh, once that notification is received, uh, it, the reasonable expectation is that emergency managers and the fire department will respond as dispatch in accordance with their policies, their operating procedures and guidelines, and then applicable statutory language. Uh, current language uh, directs railroad companies, uh, as was previously mentioned, to contact uh, the emergency manager, the fire chief, uh, directly when this incident occurs. A literal reading of this language could be interpreted to mean that they must contact um, that person directly, even if they're on vacation or otherwise not available. Uh, we've heard from several of our uh, rail companies operating in Minnesota about the difficulty in being able to fulfill this requirement, as there's really no uh, statewide comprehensive list or map of fire chiefs 
that include their jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, such information is kept at a local or county level and then is often quite uh, frequently updated. Uh, so when any type of emergency or incident occurs, uh, the PSAP is a primary communications pathway to uh, lo lo excuse me, notify local emergency personnel 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This change would allow for best industry practices in ensuring that the PSAP or that dispatch center is actively involved in the incident. So in closing, um, this bill looks to achieve swift notification during a rail incident and fits within standard practices across the state. And uh, thank you, Chair, members of the committee, Senator, for authoring this. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 3639? All right, and I did not see a fiscal note. I don't think this triggered any costs. Um, all right, uh, uh, members, to the bill. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. An effort to speed up the agenda here today. I don't think we have any issues with this. I think this is a good bill, unless any of my members want to talk on it, which I don't think they need to. Uh, it's a good bill, and we uh, think it should be approved. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. So with that, uh, we will lay Senate File 3639 on the table for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. All right, moving on to 3943, Senator Kupek. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 3943 is a bill about wayside uh, detectors. So according to the uh, Federal Railway Administration, there were 1,106 reportable derailments by all railroads in the United States last year. Uh, the five class one freight railroads operating in the United States reported 256 accidents on their main lines last year through October 11th. That is an 11% increase uh, over the same period for the previous year. Uh, one of those reasons uh, is for bearings that have gotten hot. Uh, lack of hot bearing or dragging detectors leaves train crews, locomotive engineers, and conductors without enough information on hot bearing, axles, or brakes. The train dera that derailed in East Palestine did not pass one of these detectors for nearly 20 miles. An increase in detectors will allow crews to identify the change in temperature on hot bearings at more regular intervals and preventing accidents. The requirements to place detectors uh, every 10 or 15 miles, uh, depending on the physical characteristics of the terrain, uh, mirrors language in the Federal Railway Safety Act of 2023 that is stalled in Congress. This bill would prevent train derailments by detecting defects sooner, and crews have the ability to act upon the defect with information reported to the crew, which is not always the practice now. And can we do this? Yes, the Federal Railway Administration does not regulate wayside detectors. Courts have ruled numerous times that subject matter is not preempted when federal regulations merely touch upon that subject matter. And if you'd like, I can uh, just kind of quickly highlight the bill, if you would prefer. First, uh, first um, Senator Kupek, I think we have an A1 amendment. We do have an A1 amendment. Senator McEwen, would you be willing to offer the A1? Uh, Senator McEwen offers the A1, an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Um, and uh, proceeds, um, uh, Senator Kupek. Sure. Thank you. That, Mr. Chair, and the A1 amendment is just a couple of little cleanups on, on language here. So uh, through the bill here is on uh, subdivision three, uh, wayside detector requirements. A railroad must maintain operational wayside detector systems located at an interval of every 10 miles on mainline track in the state or at least every 15 miles of mainline track again in the state if necessary to natural terrain. Uh, subdivision four goes through the defect notifications about prompt warning those and then there is also the uh, request for a report to a commissioner once a year on the number of incidents thank you all right um, Senator Kupek uh, wait one second do we have a fiscal note um, Ms. Boyd please help us understand the fiscal note here it is mr. chair uh, and members uh, yeah the fiscal note uh, has a the bill requires uh, an annual report from each railroad to MnDOT on their wayside detector systems. Uh, the, the fiscal note estimates costs re related to collecting and reviewing these reports by the department. Um, it's, it's equivalent to about 0 .01 FTE, so about $2,000 per year. And again, that would come out of the sp uh, special revenue fund uh, from the state rail, safe state rail safety inspection account. Great. Thank you. So we will go to testimony now. Um, so I have Mr. Kadich and Mr. Mueller.
And just the, the three minute or less reminder. Thank you. I'll strive for the O less. All right. Or less. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chair Dibble and committee members, again, uh, I'm Nick Kadich with Smart Transportation Division representing conductors, engineers, and yardmasters. So, Senate File 3943 addresses wayside detector systems, which are essentially a continuing safety inspection happening every time a train passes a detector, checking for defects known to cause derailments. This continuing inspection has become more important as we see mass layoffs of the experienced inspectors and their duties placed on train crews who are only trained to perform a fraction of the requirements FRA places on mechanical employees. When notified of a defect, the train crew safely stops the train at a location not blocking public road crossings and inspects the defect from the ground. This traditionally means the conductor walks back with some basic tools and reports their findings to the railroad dispatching center. The defect is either repaired in place or the car removed from the train. So within this bill are two very key pieces. First is the requirement for railroads to place and maintain wayside detectors. Second, the bill requires the train to be stopped and inspected. The current railroad practice is to keep the trains moving and then inspect at a forward location, which can mean well over 100 miles of running a train through communities with a known defect. This practice by the railroads is a key driver to why this bill is so necessary. Detectors that are ignored are useless, just like taking the batteries out of your smoke alarm. Wayside detectors in this bill do more than prevent derailments. A warm wheel may also indicate a sticking brake, which is a very easy repair for a train crew. This sticking brake is not likely to cause a derailment, but can easily set fires along the railroad tracks, which as we've seen in dry weather can spread out of control quickly. Stopping to inspect the train and repair defects like this should be required of railroads to protect the public and our Minnesota landscape. Detectors were advertised by railroads as a way to replace train crew members riding in a caboose, observing the train from the rear for smoking wheel bearings or other defects. The caboose is long gone and we still don't have a complete network of detectors and the decision by the railroads not to stop and inspect their trains for defects is a literal disaster waiting to happen. There are more advanced defect detector systems available to railroads and some have elected to deploy them on parts of their network. This bill is not meant to take away from any progress, but to set a minimum standard promised by the railroad companies when they implemented detector systems following the removal of human eyes monitoring and reporting the condition of trains. Statements made by railroads about what they're working towards should be treated with caution, and I would say they're still working towards implementing the original detector plan 40 years later and have come up short. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kadich. Great job. Mr. Mueller, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Chair Dibble, members of the committee, I'm Joel Mueller with the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. Uh, Senator Kupek, he cited the alarming statistics, uh, safety statistics within the rail industry. And uh, this reverses a decades long trend where the industry consistently showed reductions in injuries, derailments, and deaths year after year. We believe a lot of these uh, derailments and accidents and incidents can be attributed to drastic cuts in maintenance, in track, uh, maintenance and inspection of track, locomotives, and equipment. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, BNSF laid off hundreds of employees that inspect and maintain freight equipment. And uh, alarmingly, last summer, Federal Railroad Administration inspectors were kicked out of many, uh, Union Pacific's North Platte, Nebraska yard after they, they found a 22% defect rate on freight cars inspected. Uh, this should be concerning because a significant amount of traffic that arrives from Minnesota on UP's rail system comes from North Platte, Nebraska. Um, again, this is proven technology 50, uh, that's been around for over 50 years. Uh, we understand there are advancements in technology, but this bill only sets a minimum standard. Uh, another key component of this bill, uh, many of the Minnesota's rail lines do not, do not even uh, meet the industry's baseline of 15 mile separation. And I want to highlight one rail corridor in southern Minnesota where uh, it's a 108 mile rail line that is a key line for hauling ethanol. And along that corridor, there is only one defect detector. Uh, within the industry, we have heard the carriers uh, discussing trending analysis rules, absolute temperature requirements. This uh, information is not available to employees in the field who may be unaware of a wheel with a hot bearing in their train. Uh, according to the NTSB's uh, preliminary report uh, regarding the East Palestine disaster. 
Oh, the wheel that caused the derailment registered a temperature of 103 degrees above ambient temperature at the wayside defect det detector that it had passed over 20 miles before the derailment. The crew never received any notification of this, and this is far below the 170 degree stop and inspect standard the industry says they are uh, shooting for. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration does not regulate wayside defect detectors. In fact, the railroads are actively working to ensure the federal government does not act on this issue. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration has established a Railway Safety Advisory Committee to consider regulation on wayside defect detectors. No, but no hap action has been taken yet and final rulemaking may be many, many, many years away. Uh, Minnesota, Minnesota cannot wait for the federal government to come up with regulations on these devices. Uh, SF3943 is a step in the right direction on the way to common sense railroad safety that protects workers and the environment and communities. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mueller. I, I will have a question for you, so stay close. I uh, want to follow up on, on something that you shared in your testimony. Um, so, we'll, But we'll keep moving for the time being on uh, testimony. Um, Amber Backus and then have, uh, Mark Wagner from TCNW. Welcome thank, to the committee. Yes, thank you again, Mr. Chair and members. Amber Backus with the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association. And we would agree that what happened in East Palestine was a horrific tragedy, but the approach this bill takes is backwards. It doesn't use the latest tech detector technology to get the best safety outcomes. Senate file 3943 requires installation of two specific types of detectors, hot bearing and equipment dragging, as you heard, using an arbitrarily chosen mileage standard. There's no data behind this approach. Railroads in Minnesota have already installed thousands of data-driven detectors across Minnesota utilizing 12 technologies, including temperature, acoustic, sonic, and machine vision systems. These different detector technologies enable pr precise identification of potential equipment defects well before they are expected to happen, so you have well advanced notice so if something's not happening at the time. And these detectors are selected in place based on the most effective type for each location that could be based on the top topography, um, based on whether there's a populated area or not, those kind of considerations. Mandating reactive versus predictive detectors in arbitrary locations diverts resources from strategically placing detectors where they're truly beneficial. This will prevent railroads from investing in new technologies with potentially greater safety benefits. Furthermore, the bill requires all these mandated detectors to be installed in less than nine months' time. The regional and short line railroads do not have the capital to fund these installations, as each detector costs around $200,000, and those railroads will need to raise prices on crop fertilizer, ethanol, and other customers to cover the costs of the mandate. Additionally, the tight time frame will disrupt current freight movement on all railroads and add delays for Minnesota's agribusiness, mining, and manufacturing as they move their products to global markets. And there's a letter in your packets from the shipping community reflecting these concerns. Minnesota's railroads are happy to work with you on solutions to address specific safety challenges, but an arbitrary requirement that diverts resources from data-driven and proven responses is not in anyone's best interest, and for those reasons, we'd ask you to oppose Senate File 3943. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Wagner. And then uh, we have Jason Tolley from Union Pacific. Following Jason Tolley will be Travis Owsley from BNSF. Welcome, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. My name is Mark Wagner, I'm President and CEO of the Twin Cities and, West, <coughs> Twin Cities and Western Railroad, the uh, short line railroad that is, uh, <coughs> runs up right next to where the Southwest Light Rail is going to run. Um, this bill concerns us primarily because of the cost. I mean, uh, we haul ethanol from uh, Granite Falls, Minnesota into Minneapolis, St. Paul, and we do it safely. Uh, our practice is we maintain our track at a 40 mile an hour standard. We operate non-hazmat trains at 30 mile an hour, and any train that has a hazmat material in it, we limit it to 25 miles an hour. So we're trying to, you know, reduce risk, reduce derailments, that sort of thing. If we're forced to do this, it'll cost us $2 million. Well, we don't have $2 million hanging around, and, and the sole reason we would have to do this is because of our ethanol plant in uh, Granite Falls. So guess who's going to ha ultimately have to pay for that? And so it's troubling to us. Um, we're very dil diligent about inspecting our trains. We have two certified uh, rail car inspectors that inspect every train. Um, our train crews actually visualize the, the trains as they're uh, going along 
uh, when the second crew is going by. And as a result of the Southwest Light Rail project, there are going to be two detectors installed in uh, one in Minneapolis, where we right before we junction with the BNSF west of downtown Minneapolis, and then a second one in uh, the Minnetonka Eden Prairie border, of which Met Council is paying for, and um, we're in the midst of doing our protocols with them to, to figure out how that's going to notify our trains as they're going through. But uh, by and large, we do uh, proactive things outside of these uh, wayside detectors to ensure the safe passage of uh, moving this freight. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wegner. So I'm um, just going back to the list here. So Jason Tolley of UP, and then Travis Housley of Burlington Northern Santa Fe, and then Solange de Blois, de Blois with uh, Canadian Pacific Kansas City. Welcome. Mr. Chair, committee. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Tahuli. I'm a certified locomotive engineer for the Union Pacific Railroad. Over my 29-year career, I've been promoted through various positions, starting out as a conductor, engineer, and now I'm the director of operating practices and rules at Union Pacific. I'd like to thank the Senate Transportation Committee for the attention on railroad safety, though I rise in opposition to Senate File 3943 regarding wayside detectors. Some overall observations to begin. As technology has advanced, so have incredible leaps in the rail industry safety performance. Since the early 1970s, accident rates have fallen 80%. The Union Pacific team since 2004 has reduced employee personal injuries by 36%, and we have reduced derailments by 15%. While these reductions are due in large measure to the diligence of the company's hardworking employees, technology has aided in this advancement. Wayside detector technology of various types, such as hot bearing, acoustic bearing, hot wheel, dragging equipment, high wide, and even radiation detectors have been deployed across the system for decades, voluntarily by the industry. Each year, more installed, such as the 80 to 100 hot bearing detectors being installed this year at Union Pacific. UP spacing averages less than 17 miles. Railroads in the Federal Railroad Administration have agreed to install an additional detectors to achieve an average of 15 miles. By 2025, UP will have slightly less than 15 miles between detectors within range of the policy proposed in Senate File 3943, but the proposal to publicly disclose device locations and functional details competes with transportation security priorities. Referring to the subject of defect notifications, Union Pacific has robust rules and procedures in place for how crews should respond to alerts from wayside detectors. When a detector is provided notification, a UP mechanical responder on the ground will make the safest overall decision in repositioning a car uh, as needed. If it's stopped on a bridge or in a tunnel, we're going to have some flexibility to move that to a safe location for immediate repair. In conclusion, the bill would require railroads to install wayside detectors in their networks at intervals that the state of Minnesota has dictated but the construction and operation of railroad facilities is one of the explicit items on the list that the federal law prevents states from regulating. Wayside detector advances guided by science and evidence and not arbitrary factors are making the railroad safer. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. All right, moving on to Mr. Owsley and then uh, Ms. Uh, Solange de Blois. Welcome. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, committee members. I'm Travis Owsley with BNSF Railway. Uh, just to start to say we appreciate Senator Kupek's interest in wayside detectors. Uh, we are proud to have voluntarily installed thousands of wayside detectors across our network, and we are committed to continuous improving, improvement and safety, uh, including further building out and refining our detector network. Um, as you've already heard, the, uh, the, the Railway Safety Advisory Committee has been, has taken up the task of evaluating potential regulations and technical standards uh, governing uh, aspects of wayside detectors. Uh, the RSAC is the first step of FRA's collaborative rulemaking process, and it pulls in expertise from large and small railroads, unions, state transportation safety regulators, uh, and equipment manufacturers to ensure that Railroad safety regulations are, are informed by the, the best technical thinking from all stakeholders in the industry. 
Um, that said, and, and here's where I'll apologize for sounding like a broken record here, but uh, we have concerns that, that Senate File 3943 uh, would also be preempted under federal law regardless of the outcome of the RSAC process. Uh, ultimately, a law that is seeking to mandate when and what kind of wayside detectors are installed is a law that is seeking to govern when, where, and how railroad rolling stock is inspected for mechanical defects. And the FRA already uh, maintains and enforces a comprehensive body of regulation concerning the, the inspection requirements and the mechanical health of railroad rolling stock. So in short, you know, because the FRA has already fully occupied this space with regulations concerning this subject matter, this would be another instance of a state law touching upon the same subject matter and would be preempted under the Federal Railroad Safety Act. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And our final testifier um, is remote um, from uh, CPKC. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Um, you can speak up just a little bit. That would be great. Perfect. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Dibble and uh, committee. My name is Solange de Bois. I know it's hard, it's French. <laughs> I am the Assistant Director of Mechanical Technology at Canadian Pacific Kansas City Railway. I'm a mechanical reliability engineer by education and also a qualified locomotive engineer that has driven revenue trains. I've worked directly with Wayside Detector Technology for close to eight years in the railway industry. And I'm also a member of several um, American Association of Railway and FRA uh, committees, including the Rail Safety Advisory Committee, Asset Health and Equipment Health Committees. On behalf of CPKC, I wish to express our concerns with Senate File 3943. Safety is a core principle at CPKC and foundational to everything we do, especially our focus on investment and innovation. Since 2013, our capital investment has increased, driving down train accident frequency rates by 45% from 1.8 to less than one incident per million train miles traveled. CPKC reinvests upwards of 20% of our revenue back into the business, and each year CPKC allocates 60% of its capital investments towards safety and replacement initiatives to ensure our network remains safe and efficient. It is with that industry-leading safety record and fine eye towards significant capital investment and innovation that we oppose uh, SF3943. Mandating specific types of detectors in arbitrary locations demonstrates that there is no science, engineering, or understanding of railway safety infrastructure behind this legislation. CPKC uses a variety of technologies to predict and prevent incidents. Our suite of diverse wayside detectors nearly all fielded voluntarily include acoustic bearing detectors, broken rail detectors, dragging equipment detectors, hot box detectors, truck hunting, wheel impact load detectors, and wheel profile detectors. Most of these predictive detectors and are not reactive sensors. CPKC's investment in wayside technology over the past two decades exceeds $200 million. CPKC monitors detector performance using a series of automated rules. These rules are dependent based on our suite of detector types, something this bill does not take into account. The result is that CPKC's wayside detectors are extremely effective at finding defects. Our remote safety inspection process uses a combination of in-office remote safety inspectors, train inspection portal systems, wayside detectors, advanced algorithms. The RSI process does not eliminate the human inspector from the visual inspection. In fact, over the last seven years, CP has hired almost 200 additional full-time employees qualified in rail car inspection and repair. Uh, our remote safety inspection process and wayside technology greatly assists those employees in doing field-based inspections and in identifying defects. This, these processes have resulted in 93% of our defects for roller bearings are found by detectors. 85% of all air brake related defects are driven by our cold wheel detector process. 95% reduction in defects identified by hot box detectors since we deployed the use of acoustic bearing detectors and our patched data analytic algorithms. 
train and engine employees, the folks driving trains, are not experts in mechanical defects, as was stated earlier. Relying on untrained personnel, which is what 3943 would force the industry to do, to judge a bearing in the field would only open up the rail network to increase risk. When everything we do, what we need your help doing is aimed at reducing risk. EPKC has a health monitoring system for detectors to ensure that missed alerts do not occur. If a detector issues a false alert, CPKC will have a qualified employee check the detector and repair it. 99.9% .9 of our detectors are working at any given time. That is our standard. In conclusion, CPKC firmly concurs with the other test tires that 3943 is waiting to areas covered by federal law, undermining national uniformity in terms of rail safety and interstate commerce. If passed into law, SF3943, would unnecessarily handcuff CPKC's implementation of rail safety measures that have always been and need to continue being specifically tailored and responsive to the varying situations and dynamic environments of our industry. Thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 3943? Okay. Um, so, uh, members, uh, Here's uh, just to foreshadow a little the plan here. Um, Senator Kupek needs to get to the Ag Committee for a little bit, and so we're going to finish this bill of his, and then we're going to the Senator Howe's bill. So, all right, to the bill, uh, members. Senator Duszynski. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Senator Kupek, so I'm looking in the bill at one point to where do we pick the 10 mile, the 10 mile distance and the 15 mile in the back? Did that come from some number? They just pick a number out of the sky, or how was the 10 mile or the 15 mile uh, separation found? Sure. Uh, Senator Kubek. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, you, Senator Jasinski. This is, um, I believe, the language uh, for this was based on a bill that was also in Ohio, uh, and that they had picked it out. And for some of it, I think it was trying to, you know, come up with a reasonable distance that things could be detected. Part of that language in Ohio. You know, their language came out of their experience with what happened in East Palestine. And so I think we based that language on that. Thank you, Mr. So is there data that supports the 10 miles? Or, again, it just seems, I mean, 10 miles, 50 miles, seems like it was just picked out of the air. So is there data that supports 10 miles from somewhere from wherever it was? Senator Kubek. I would be, I would be happy to refer to one of my experts who would possibly know more on this, but um, I think, it, you know, my understanding was um, that, that that seemed like a reasonable distance to try to catch things in between towns where they were. Thank you. Mr. Mueller, help us out. Yeah, uh, Senator Dibble, Senator Jasinski, um, yes, the, that is a, uh, exactly right. It's uh, based on the language from Ohio, and it has... Uh, uh, roots with the East Palestine derailment, as I stated in my uh, testimony, that uh, the train that derailed there passed over a detector 20 miles prior to the derailment and it never picked up the defect that led to the derailment. Mr. Chair, Senator Zinsky. So, if they would have picked 15 miles and 20 miles, that's what we would have done the bill as. I mean, again, it just seems like this number that came out of nowhere, and it, you know, 10 miles and 15 miles, it could have been 15 and 20 or 18 and 22. It just, I don't, I don't see any data behind it. It's more of a where we're starting the conversation uh, is 10 miles. Uh, if you know, you know, we're with the 20 mile. Uh, issue in Ohio, in East Palestine, we, we thought we would start with a 10 mile with a, a little leeway based on terrain on where you can install the detectors. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, it just sounds to me like there's no real data that supports it. It was just a number that was picked, so thank you. Mr. Kadich. Chair Dibble and Senator Jasinski, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, the, the number absolutely came from the Ohio language. Uh, quite frankly, uh, Mr. Mueller and I were really hoping the railroads would come back and say, okay, maybe 10 miles doesn't work for us, but let's look at 15 to 20, for example. We were really hoping for a conversation here, but instead what we found is an absolute stone wall. And that's brought us to this point now where we're looking at a 10-mile number, which in my experience as a, as a railroad conductor, that seems reasonable. Um, 
my experience in northern Minnesota with defect detectors that were spaced 15 to 20 miles apart voluntarily, we had incidents in between them. Mm -hmm. And we saw brakes that would stick after a set and release and maybe were setting fires. And so these things, uh, it comes from experience and it also came from a hope of a conversation that has not been allowed to happen. Thank you. And I'll just uh, wade into the fray. I see uh, Ms. Backus approaching. Um, maybe we'll hear from Ms. Backus, and then I, I have a response. So, or, and Mr. Mr. Chair, I can Senator also Kubik. I will also yes. add. I also add. You know, we I had a discussion with this uh, with this with BNSF, and they said you know in places like Western Nebraska where it is very open land, they do not have as many detectors out there, and I I fully get that, but I'm certainly open to with some enlightenment on those to, to do that, so. Great, thanks. Ms. Beckus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd also like to respond to that. We've had multiple conversations with Senator Kubek about alternatives to this bill, recognizing the work that the FRA is doing in terms of that first step of a, a rulemaking on this issue. So I, I wouldn't characterize this as stonewalling at all. I apologize that conversation wasn't directly with Mr. Kadich, but we've definitely been talking to the author about different alternatives to what's been presented Great. here. I appreciate that. Senator Jasinski. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And then just to follow up, so again, so the class one versus class two and the, the short lines and things like that. So again, that 10 mile, 15 mile, if they're traveling at much slower speeds with their hazardous waste, again, it's still a 10 mile or 15 mile, so it doesn't, doesn't weigh into that. You know, it's more of a one size fits all. And how would you apply that to the short lines? Because to me, it seems like over excessive for the short lines to, to have to abide by that same thing again when they're only going 10 miles or 25 or whatever the, the, the speeds that were quoted here. It just seems like overkill of a one size fits all for, for short lines. And again, this is an expense that's going to be passed on to everybody. They're going to increase the rates because they have to put these in, then the consumer is going to pay more. And I, and I understand the safety standpoint, but it almost seems like we're trying to put legislation and there's no problem already. And again, with the preemptive and the FRA, why are we making it more restrictive here in Minnesota than we are you know, nationally is my question. Senator Kupek. Sure. Thank you, Senator Dibbleson, and thank you, Senator Jaczynski. Uh, and, and in terms of, so I have been in conversations with the short line, and yes, I, I am open to, I think, you know, going to track with a higher speed, realizing that the 10 mile per hour threshold was that. What I have not gotten back is good data about how many, how many miles of track are just at 10 miles per hour and how many are at a slightly higher speed. But I think, you know, we could accommodate either the, the class two, class three railroads, you know, with a slightly higher speed that would then lower the cost for them going forward. So I'm totally open to that. Just that, I'm missing that kind of piece to come up with what that would actually be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Someone else. Thank you. Now. All right, uh, members. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it, uh, Senator Cooper, could as far as the detectors and notification of the rail crew, is it is it the intent of the bill to the rail crew gets notified every time a notification comes off a wayside detector? Senator Cooper. Thank you. I think if that's okay with you, I would defer to, you know, somebody who's actually had experience with these. Mr. Mueller. Operating. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Dibble, uh, Senator Howe. That is actually uh, absolutely what the intent of the bill is, uh, that portion of the bill is. Uh, to give a little background, uh, up until about roughly five years ago, the railroad crews operating the trains would get a notification when there was a defect detected in the train. Uh, since that time, we're not getting the notifications, and when we arrive at yards and terminals and we're watching the train as it rolls in, we sense, uh, we find uh, cars with handbrakes on, sticking brakes. This causes uh, heat uh, from friction uh, uh, that could lead to mechanical defects. Is Follow up, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so as, as this goes, are all the notifications an alarm? Or coming from a, a fire guy standpoint, when I set up a fire system in a, in a, when I, the requirements for a fire alarm system, we have systems that just go like a duck smoke detector on a roof top unit. That just puts out a supervisory signal to the monitoring station who then calls whoever is running that 
facility to, hey, go check your rooftop unit. You've got a smoke detector going off. They did not call the fire department to respond on a supervisor, it's strictly a supervisory signal. Are you saying that every one of these detectors, when it goes off, it's an alarm? That's exactly what I'm saying, yes. All right, Who, I'm sorry, lost track here. Who's up? Senator Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I think I'd like to hear from maybe one of the uh, rail providers, because I, I think that, you know, you might have something there. I wouldn't think that everything is an alarm that you're going to shut down a train. I, I think some things are, hey, you might want to look at this the next stop. So if we could hear from maybe one of the rail providers to give us an end, I'd like to know what that disruption would be if you stopped every time a detector went off. Uh, Mr. Owsley, just introduce yourself again and proceed. Jason Tahuli, Union Pacific. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee. Um, so th th there, there was a lot there, so let me, let me start with, um, I, I don't know all the details of every detector, but every detector that has a defect for the train that the crew needs to know about is notified. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, how the acoustic and, and that stuff, if it's, you know, every one of them is not going to be an alarm. It sounded like uh, from the testimony that those would be future. It's, it's being predictive, and they would make those calls based off of their data and algorithm to, to take care of those. But if it's something going on with that train now, they're going to know. Now, uh, at one time, there was a lot of complaint of the radio chatter from all detectors always announcing. There was an entrance message, basically, you, you, you know, the detector this mile post, then your train would clear and it'd give you no defects. Some of those are talk on arrival and defect only, so it'll tell you, okay, you're, you're at the detector, but you won't get anything if there's no defect. But if there's a defect, the crew's going to be known if it's, there's a problem with the train. Senator Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as soon as that detector goes off, that, can you explain where that with notification goes and then how that notification gets back to the rail crew? So it's broadcast over the radio. They have the radio inside the locomotive cab as they're traversing the track. They would hear that and respond accordingly to, uh, accordingly to that uh, detector message. All right. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I guess when I want to ask uh, one of the testifiers, uh, um, it says in one of the, the uh, supporting letters here, it talks about that the rail industry collects, controls, distributes all the data related to rail accidents or incidents. Um, do we have that now? Can, is there some place where that, you know, we talk about data, but it sounds like there isn't any data. Is there data somewhere today, and where do I find it? Mr. Mueller. Mr. Kadich. Uh, Chair Dibble, uh, Senator uh, Carlson, there is some data to that the FR that is reported to the FRA, but this data does not necessarily reflect everything that happens in the industry, uh, and specifically near misses and close calls that could have potentially resulted in tragedy. And Mr. Chair, Senator Carlson, uh, you know we we have the uh, you know, one of the dangers here is to the towns that the railroad goes through. And I think we've seen a lot of major um, incidents that have happened to towns and they cost a lot of money to clean up and to fix and, you know, and there's a lot of threats and a lot of evacuations, things like that. Um, and, uh, and I guess maybe that's why the League of Minnesota Cities is supporting this bill, which uh, I, I think I'm, I'm very uh, supportive of people trying to protect their home and land and property. And so something like this, I, is it something that, uh, for instance, you mentioned, uh, we, we mentioned, I think, the uh, when you depart a rail yard, you, there's, an, there's a detector. That isn't even important, I wouldn't think, unless you're talking about detecting things that are dragging underneath the, uh, the cars. But you're not talking about hot boxes there. Hot boxes are when you're when you're going full speed and, and uh, you're going through grasslands or something like that. And I think everybody everybody knows that when you go near a railroad track somewhere in, in uh, your travels in greater Minnesota, you see burned grass. 
you know, so there's a lot of incidents that, you know, that do catch uh, the uh, local areas on fire, and I would assume that that's main, mainly hot boxes. Uh, so I, I guess I, I'm seeing this as something that is kind of important, not only to detect and to warn the train crew, but also to uh, uh, catch something early, like a, uh, a grass fire that might uh, spread into a woods or somewhere else. So, uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, this data collection is important too, to know whether these things are going to do any good or not. You know, I would like to know that if they're going to do any, you know, if they're going to improve things. So, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Carlson. I don't know if that warrants a response. I'm sure you agree. We will take that as such. Um, all right, um, so with that, uh, anything further, members? Uh, Senator Jasinski? Uh, Mr. Chair, was there someone online that had to raise their hand? I thought I saw yeah, it for a second. Or? Yeah, um, she did have her hand up, but yeah. took it down. Yeah. So or Ms. Backus, did you have DeBlue. another question or a comment? Okay. All right. Sorry. Thank uh, you. Oh, okay. okay, go ahead, Ms. DeBlois. DeBlois. Uh, DeBlois, yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to intrude, but I was just uh, wanted to address the question asked about uh, crew notifications as my team works directly with every single detector type we employ at CPKC. Um, crews are only notified of uh, action, uh, detector, waste of detector alert if they need to take action. So there are, there, as, as was stated, there are a lot of predictive algorithms that are working behind the scenes that the crews are not notified of, but anything that is required that the crew takes action is broadcasted over the radio or direct the radio to them via the dispatcher. So that, that was my... Uh, All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mr. Kadich. Chair Dibble and, and committee members, I think we've, we've just heard, um, you know, from the railroads that sometimes train crews are notified and sometimes they aren't. And it's up to the, the discretion of the railroads. And I I think I would ask, what is the goal of the railroads? It's to move freight and not derail. But as Minnesotans, we're also looking at what is the damage that's happening to uh, our communities as they're traveling through? Are they setting fires? Is dragging equip equipment hitting road crossings and flying off into cars or pedestrians? That is another function of these detectors that can't be overlooked. So while the railroad's goals are in line with what their priorities are, I think uh, as Minnesotans and as communities, we also have additional priorities that need to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to, talking about that and talking about our city, so does Minnesota have a higher rate of, of accidents in Minnesota than other states? And why are we being more regulative here than we are nationally or the, with the FRA? It just seems like there sounds like an issue uh, here, and we're putting all these higher regulations on it, but I don't know that we have statistics that show we have higher uh, railroad incidences or safety incidences. Can you just touch upon that, please? Mr. Kadich. Chair Dibble and Senator Jasinski. Um, I'm speaking directly about Minnesota because that's where our authority lies. And so staying within the borders of um, the members that I represent uh, and definitely the jurisdiction of this body. That is, that's why you're only hearing about Minnesota today for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then does anyone in the audience have statistics for Minnesota versus other states? I mean, again, I just, you know, I understand the safety issue. I really do. But it just seems like we, we've become so over-regulatory. And from what I've seen in the railroads, they follow rigorous uh, inspection requirements and everything else. And it just seems like we're going over the top here again. And, and it, it seems to be a trend. Uh, everything is so regulatory and we're causing, everybody says it's inflation, but it's not inflation. It's, it's regulation. We're just causing more and more price increases from you name it, it's just increasing things. And it just seems to me, again, we have a preemptive thing with the federal FRA and why Minnesota seems to have this effort to keep continuing to high, higher and higher and higher standards. So just my well, comment. Senator Zinsky, I would, uh, I would disagree. And mm -hmm. I'm going to be sharing some information in a few minutes as soon as I have it available. But the railroads have been utterly failing uh, in their duty uh, to keep uh, freight rail safe. The, the number of accidents, deaths, injuries has only been going up, up and up and up. 
so much so that uh, the, uh, the Secretary of Transportation yesterday issued a scathing letter to the railroad industry um, saying that they are doing nothing to improve the situation and they need to do way more than they're doing. That's why we have these continual bills that pop up at the state level. Uh, and you see here, here the railroads themselves testify, we're doing everything we can, nothing to see here, you're just gonna drive costs. And the, and the analysis that the Secretary provided was um, you know, $25 billion profits that they made last year. Um, and, they're, and they're so focused on those short-term profits and they're not investing in safety in the way they need to. And so we're trying to do what we can at the, at the state level. So they don't, it's not for lack of money. They have, they made, the, the class ones made $25 billion in profits last year. So they've got the money. They need to spend it on keeping our communities safe. So thank you, I respectfully disagree. <laughs> Wanted to share that perspective. All right, um, so we are now going to lay Senate file 3943 on the table, and uh, we're gonna call Senator Weber forward. Senator Howe, thank you. Um, we just have a visitor, so you're a member of the committee, so we thought we'd take Senator Weber so long as he's here. Um, and we were gonna take up uh, Senate file 1155, which we heard in taxes, referred to transportation, and then we're gonna send it back to taxes. I think I had indicated it was gonna be laid over, but we're actually gonna send it back to taxes because I think the intention is for the chair to pull it into her omnibus tax. All right, so, oh, there's an amendment and a fiscal, or a revenue note or a fiscal note? To, all right. I'm guessing if it's a tax bill, it's a revenue note. Um, so Senator Weber, why don't you um, proceed? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, yes, the reason that I'm in front of you today is the fact that uh, this bill was approved in last year's tax bill. Uh, during, uh, after session, the uh, Department of Revenue decided that they needed additional language that would uh, enable uh, the, the credit. And so one of the elements that was added was uh, to qualify for the credit under this section, uh, an, an eligible taxpayer must apply to the Commissioner of Transportation for a credit certificate. And that's what has kicked this bill into the Transportation Committee. Uh, I believe there is a fiscal note that talks about a $33,000 a year potential cost uh, to the uh, Transportation Department uh, for uh, this provision. And um, I think, and, and, and just in passing, uh, the credit was designed for short line railroads uh, that needed to replace and repair track uh, ties and whether the main line sidings, et cetera. Thank you, and so when I was uh, ranting about the $25 billion, that was the class one railroads, not the short line, not these local, <laughs> uh, these local small um, uh, uh, carriers um, that, that connect the class ones and connect small towns and, and that sort of thing. And, and I think we've shown an interest in, in supporting those um, uh, with some public effort to match their private effort that they go to for their, for their facilities and their equipment and their rail and their tracks and, and things like that. So the A3 actually, um, I now understand, is not necessary because it, it just represents, um, it, was, it was adopted and, uh, and it does represent the, first in, the language right. of first engrossment. So we don't need to take up the A3. With that, um, Questions from the committee? All right, did you have anyone to testify, Senator Weber? No. All right. No, I just... All right. Senator Jasinski, do you want to move um, Senator Weber's bill and refer it back to taxes? I thank you, Mr. Chair. I recommend Senate file number 1155, I believe not as amended, just standard, be recommended, approved, and uh, re referred to taxes. Great, thanks. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank All you, right. Mr. Thank Chair. you so much. Do I get a prize for the shortest presentation today? Uh, we had one shorter, <laughs> slightly shorter, <laughs> but you get the second prize. Senator Howe. All right, Senator Howe is here to present Senate File 3857. And Senator Howe, I understand you have a couple of amendments. I do, Mr. Chair. One would be a delete all, and then the other one, that would be the A2, and then I have an A4 that amends the delete all. Great, all right. So why don't we take, um, and we'll just treat them both as author's amendments. So Senator Howe moves the A1, I'm sorry, 
excuse me. What is that? Uh, Senator Howe moves the A2, uh, delete everything amendment to Senate file 3857. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. And then Senator Howe moves the A4 amendment to the A2DE amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Senate file 3857 uh, basically goes back and looks at a bill, uh, some statute that goes all the way back to 1943. And I don't think it's really been looked at since 90, 1943. So this is a, an attempt to update it and bring it up and actually apply some clarifying language to it defining uh, some terms such as depot company, passenger service, railway company. And then, and, I, and the reason that this came about is, uh, and I don't know how many folks know about this rail to road program, but what it does is we bring in, uh, in, in my uh, district I have a, I have con I've got uh, granite that goes out on short line. Uh, I've got uh, ag products, uh, and then I have LP that comes in and out, and then I have concrete mix. And the rail to road is actually a, ra a concrete mix comes in on rail uh, to a rail to road terminal, and then it gets offloaded onto trucks to go out to the uh, ready mix plants. And so the 1943 law requires uh, terminals to be at 22 feet high and some other restrictions laterally. And uh, I'm not quite sure when this all changed, but uh, there is a disagreement really on the requirements of why it's at 22 feet and why some aren't at 22 feet. There was that there's an exemption, and if you read it in plain language, you would believe that terminals for offloading and loading of passengers and commodities would be exempt. But uh, that's it, it could be interpreted the other way too. So that's why we got the bill in front of us is try to provide some clarity to that fact. And uh, I, at this time, I'd uh, like to go to my testifier and and let him bring up the. Uh, some of the issues that we're faced with. Thank you, Senator Howe. Um, uh, I'll first ask, um, is there a fiscal note? No fiscal note to go over. And so then we'll go to Mr. Clark Meyer, uh, Road to Rail, Ellis and Eastern Railroad, who's online. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and I thank you for the opportunity to work here with uh, Senator Howe on uh, cleaning up this bill. My name is Clark Meyer. I'm the president of Rail to Road and also Ellison Eastern Company. We are a subsidiary of Knife River Company, which is uh, an aggregate based business that operates in 14 states and have over 5,700 employees. The Rail to Road Company that we have is a, is a part of our business that has five different transloading facilities. Uh, two of those are in Minnesota. And in the Ellison Eastern portion of our company is actually a shoreline railroad uh, operating on 65 miles of track, 41, which are in uh, Rock and Nobles County. Uh, talking to the, uh, I'm, I'm talking today in support of the amendment. It would update and clarify the language regarding the rail clearances. And this is directly affecting the safety of our employees who get up on top of these rail cars many 50 times a day. And we need to make that uh, the clearances make accessing the top of those rail cars uh, not as safe. Just like the minimum clearances that are waived for passenger train services so riders can get on and off rail cars, these uh, minimum clearance waives should also be waived for unloading facilities and depot companies so we can uh, safely access the car during the loading process. Uh, as, as Senator mentioned, this bill was drafted in 1913. Uh, it was amended in 1943 and has some antiquated terms in there uh, and definitions that are hard to agree upon. The statute exempts yards and terminals of depot companies. Uh, we believe our operation is exempt as we need to access these rail cars, uh, exempt from the minimum, maximum clearances. 
and we uh, we support updating the language for for clarification and ensure safe practices. Lastly, uh, the statute defines the minimums, and any rail company operating in the state, uh, if they believe they need any more clearances in the yard, terminal, or depot company, they can specify what that uh, clearance should be in that facility through their local um, ITA, which is an industry track agreement we all have, depending on the commodity and car type. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, Senator Howe, any, anyone, any further testifiers? Uh, I have no other testifiers. All right. Would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 3857? All right. Questions from the committee? No. All right. I like that. I don't have any either. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, we will lay Senate File 3857 uh, as amended over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Mr. In Chair. In a future omnibus bill. All right. Thanks. So we have a couple of uh, non-committee members in the room. Um, and I think, s who got here first? <laughs> Dres. Senator Drezkowski, why don't you come forward? Uh, we'll take up Senate file 3813. Welcome, Senator Drezkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Um, OK. So uh, Senator Drezkowski, why don't we um, Take up your amendment and your amendment to your amendment first. Thank you. Um, so, Senator Jasinski, would you like to offer the A1 delete everything amendment? So moved. All right. To the A1, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. And, Senator Jasinski, would you like to offer the A4 to the A1? I move the A4. Senator Jasinski offers the A4. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. I mean, Drzeskowski. <laughs> All these uh, Eastern European names. That I can we get confused yeah. a lot. Sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Drzeskowski. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, members, um, uh, Senate file 3813 is um, a bill that uh, I wrote in response to uh, something that happened this last year in my district. Um, we had um, a flurry of, of uh, uh, warnings that were issued to farmers, and the farmers were reporting back to me at the time uh, that they were alarmed at the, at the fact that they were getting these warnings from law enforcement about a behavior, Mr. Chair, members, that they had been doing for a long time, uh, and they understood, at least the farmers did, to be uh, operating within the law. Um, and uh, after a while, um, I, uh, I, I, after, after reviewing uh, the law and uh, talking more with the farmers and also with law enforcement, it became clear, Mr. Chair, that um, we needed to maybe provide some more uh, specificity in the law so that both sides, both the law enforcement and the farmers, had more direction than they do currently. So uh, this is an attempt to do that, and um, that's, that's clearly what it is, and really all that it is, there's not any interest group here. It's just to try to bring some improvement and understanding from uh, both for both law enforcement and for the farmers who are attempting to operate within the law. And I've got a couple of testifiers, a Goodhue County Sheriff's Deputy, Mr. Chair, and a farmer from Goodhue County. Uh, thank you, and I believe they're both uh, remote. They're online, so we'll take um, uh, John Hunnicky from Goodhue County, Sheriff's Deputy. Welcome to the committee. Uh, welcome, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes, thanks. I'll try to get my video working, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and other committee members. Uh, my name is Jonathan Hunnicky. I am the Chief Deputy of the Goodyear County Sheriff's Office. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 3814. Uh, we at the Sheriff's Office have talked about this bill. Um, the bill um, allows for drivers of implements to avoid obstacles safely and to continue on their travel when safe to do so. Um, ob obstacles encountered uh, can range from bike riders, mailboxes, vehicle parked on, vehicles parked on the side of the shoulder. Um, those vehicles could be stalled vehicles. They could be people just on their cell phone. Uh, 
Currently, if an obstacle is encountered on the roadway, the implement is only allowed to operate to the left of the center line if es escorted by a vehicle displaying hazard, hazard warning lights. In Goodyear County, we have roadways that range from 20 to 13 feet. Um, this bill would allow for the drivers of implements to safely avoid obstacles and continue on their travels. Um, we at the Goodyear County Sheriff's Office support this bill. Thank you. And we'll move on to Ryan Buck. Welcome to the committee. Hello, thank you. Welcome, please introduce yourself and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, my name is Ryan Buck. I'm a farmer in Goodyear County and I am in support of Senate File 3814. Um, as we, you know, get ready for spring field work and get ready to maneuver our equipment down the roads, we uh, face an issue there as far as transporting everything safely. As you guys well know, everything has gotten a lot larger and we don't want to be on the road any more than the general public wants to wait for us. So if we can move our stuff as safe as possible and get to the next destination and get on with our work, we, uh, we'd appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Buck. All right. Um, would anyone else like to testify on Senate file 3813? Seeing none, members, questions, comments, or amendments? No, all right. Well, uh, thank you, Senator Draskowski, for bringing this bill. Um, it seems like a common sense solution to a problem that's been identified. I appreciate your work. We will lay it over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Thanks, Thanks Mr. Time. Chair and members. All right, Senator Lucero, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. It's my understanding, thank you for, for welcoming me back. It's my understanding I am all that stands in between you and dinner tonight, so. Actually, oh, not, there's more, oh, I'm, I'm wrong then, okay. Not true, we, uh, we jumped ahead to, because we we're so excited you were here, we jumped ahead Oh, there bill. we go, yeah, well, so. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so proceed on your bill, Senate File 843, which we've heard before, so we're pretty familiar with. Um, but go ahead, because um, it's a new day. All yes, right. thank Thanks. you, Mr. Chair. I do have the A5, I'm hoping somebody can move. Mr. Chair, I move the A5. Senator Jasinski moves the A5 amendment to A43. Looks like it just changed some dates. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is a bill, if you'll notice, uh, it is Senate File 843, meaning it is a bill that's uh, been around for a while. If I could go a negative number, it would be reflective of a bill that, I, a bill that I've been carrying for about six years now. Uh, in what it does in a synopsis is, there are uh, certain vehicles that have certain exemptions from weight, like school buses, garbage trucks, et cetera. And what this essentially seeks to do is to add uh, septic pumping or holding trucks to that list of exclusions when there's emergency situations, when there's road restrictions in place and somebody is suffering a septic uh, uh, emergency that it would allow for, again, that uh, exemption. This was passed last year, hoping to just continue to move it back to, to the floor. Great, um, thank you, uh, Senator Lucero. Um, I, th I think we are, we're not gonna send it solo, we're gonna you know, keep it here and put it in an omnibus bill, and I think there might be just a, um, I was uh, being reminded by um, people who remember things better than I do, um, that, uh, there, there was, there is general consensus. Uh, maybe still a, a little bit of concern on on one party's part. I have to remind myself. I read it this morning. I'll, I'll, I'll remind. I appreciate the reminder. Yeah. So yes, there has been multiple voices over the years. Uh, the townships were, I think, among the last ones that expressed concern. We dealt with that last year. Got an amendment. There should be peace in the valley between MnDOT, the townships. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody after we had this resolved last year, which is the current language, that there is any, any concern at this point. Great, I appreciate that. That reassures me. All right, so any questions, members, comments, amendments? Nope, with that, uh, as amended, we will lay Senate File 843 on the table for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. All right, so now we need to go back to the Kupex show. Um, uh, and he's just finishing up next door in ag. Hang on one second.
we may be able to get a co-author up to help us get started on Senate file 4161. So we're just going to see if we can do that.
All right, welcome back, Senator Kupek. Senate file 4161, Senator Kupek. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm a little disappointed. I got a standing ovation when I arrived in AG to help move them along. <laughs> and I'm back here to get you back on track and no applause at all. We'll see how fast you go. And <laughs> then we'll uh, stand and applaud. <laughs> all right. So just proceed whenever you're ready. Actually, could I ask Senator McCune, do you have my folder folders? Oh, okay. Okay, Senate right. file uh, 4161 has to do with the uh, length of trains. Uh, long trains have long caused uh, congestion within the rail network due to capacity issues. Most of Minnesota's rail infrastructure is not designed for trains that exceed 8,500 feet. Sidings uh, are tracks used by railroads along the single track corridors. 95% of Minnesota's rail network uh, is single track that allows trains to meet and pass others. On a single track, the majority of the corridors in Minnesota, there are no sidings big enough for these long trains. When long trains experience mechanical issues, issues, it ties up the rail corridor because there is no ability uh, for other trains to go around the long train and it does not fit into those sidings. The Federal Railroad Administration has published two safety advisories to highlight the issue with the operation of long trains. Due to the tremendous amount of train forces and placement of locomotives within the train, couplers brakes causing train separation. This forces the train to apply the emergency brake on all cars and locomotives. When the emergency brake is applied, uh, this adds additional force uh, to the train that has led to derailments. Also, uh, in my community, where we have 80 trains a day uh, passing through, uh, sometimes the longer trains, too, that uh, have to get stopped and you know, for and block traffic through my downtowns uh, also leads to car congestion or, or around those things. Uh, railroads have seen uh, record growth uh, to the tune of billions of quarterly profits. Almost all shippers have seen shipping costs go up, though, and not down. The argument that shorter trains will change rates uh, does not hold. If that were the case, rates should be historically down right now. 78% of freight stations across the United States are captive to one single class A railroad, and therefore without the competition, uh, the rates stay higher. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would uh, turn it over to testifiers. Uh, thank you, Senator Kupek. And on the testifiers list, I have uh, Joel Mueller, followed by Amber Backus. Welcome, Mr. Mueller. Chair Dibble, members of the committee, I want to thank you again for allowing me to speak uh, on, uh, in support of uh, SF4171. In recent years, train lengths have grown from 6,000 feet when I began my career to often exceeding 15,000 feet. That's just shy of three miles. As a locomotive engineer, every day I see the negative impacts these trains have on Minnesota communities, cutting them in half, blocking first responders from getting to those in need. Uh, as Senator Kupek noted, uh, Minnesota's rail infrastructure is not designed for trains of this size. We see congestion in yards and terminals that do not have the capacity to handle a two to three mile long train. This delays other trains waiting to, or, or waiting to arrive or depart these terminals. Uh, most sightings in Minnesota's rail network are not big enough for a long train, which forces other trains to wait for hours. In Service Transportation Board uh, hearings, uh, uh, customers have complained of congestion in the rail network. This has frustrated uh, rail customers due to poor service, and forcing uh, those shippers to divert their shipments to other modes of transportation uh, that are less efficient, uh, leading to higher greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, locomotive engineers that I represent report more equipment failures due to extreme stress put on the rail equipment caused by the higher in-train forces and poor uh, placement of distributed power locomotives. Uh, several de after uh, several de 
derailments involving long trains, the Federal Railroad Administration did issue two safety advisories on train length uh, and train makeup. These documents advised railroads to amend their antiquated policies regarding train makeup and improve training for new and experienced locomotive engineers. I urge caution when considering data and statistics the railroad rail carriers will provide this committee. Training continues to be at a bare minimum uh, required under federal regulations. Train crews are often instructed to ignore company policies and procedures that take into consideration proper train makeup, uh, allowing trains to depart from their initial terminal that are not in compliance. When the employees raise concerns of this practice, they face harassment and intimidation from their managers. This uh, tracks with news reports of the same experience employees are experiencing from, from other crafts, including track inspectors and mechanical employees. Railroads are struggling with a public image problem regarding safety and derailments. Uh, one would think they'd be actively pursuing solutions, but sadly that is not the case. They are working hard to stop any federal action on this subject, and railroad safety legislation is stalled in Congress. Uh, Federal Railroad Administration also refuses to act on this issue. Uh, following the Norfolk Southern derailment and East Palestine, Ohio, we have seen little action from the rail carriers and the FRA or Congress in the realm of rail safety. <coughs> this, uh, this issue is not federally preempted because neither the Congress nor uh, the FRA has acted on this issue. The carriers attempt to downplay their, the risks posed by their operations cannot go unchallenged, especially when the stakes are so high. This is common sense legislation rooted in industry's best practices and would have little impact on the railroad's bottom line. It works with uh, the existing infrastructure and Minnesota's rail network. And I'd be happy to uh, take any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. We're going to pause uh, for one second because I jumped over the fiscal notes, which we do have. Um, Ms. Boyd, can you have to help us understand the fiscal note real quick? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and members. Uh, the fiscal note uh, has a, a small staff related cost of 5000 a year um, that's in the Department of Transportation. Um, this bill would allow for penalties. Um, that revenue would be deposited into the state rail safety inspection account. Uh, however, uh, an, a revenue amount is not estimated. Uh, MnDOT states that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, at this point to estimate the number of violations. Um, so uh, assumes approximately two hours of weekly staff time to monitor and assess the fines, though. And that's the equivalent of 0.05 FTE, or 5000 per year. Thank you. Ms. Boyd. All right. Um, looks like Ms. Bacchus is nominating someone else to come forward, please come forward and. We got nominated, congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. I'm Travis Owsley with BNSF Railway. Uh, Senate file 4161 would limit the length of trains traveling in Minnesota to 8,500 feet. In 1945, the US Supreme Court struck down a similar state law as unconstitutional and held that it could not be enforced in a case called Southern Pacific versus Arizona. In the 79 years since the Supreme Court decided this case, there has been no subsequent case or no congressional enactment that has in any way modified or limited the holding of this case. It is still to this day good law. Instead, the passage of the Interstate Commerce Commission Termination Act of 1995, or ICTA, uh, placed exclusive jurisdiction over rail transportation, including rates, scheduling, routing, and operating practices with the Surface Transportation Board. So while you will not find a federal statute or regulation that provides a maximum permissible train length, there is federal law establishing that only one agency has the jurisdiction to establish such a standard. But even in the absence of that statute, there is controlling Supreme Court precedent that's established in a state law that seeks to limit uh, train length, poses an unreasonable burden on interstate commerce, and is unenforceable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owsley. Ms. Backus. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate your flexibility there. Again, Amber Backus with the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association. 
Um, I would like to remark that for the last 80 years, railroads have operated millions of trains exceeding 8,500 feet without incident. And just to correct the record, um, based on 2021 data, less than 1% of trains in the state um, are longer than 14,000 feet. But a recent report from the Alliance for Infrastructure and Innovation, an independent think tank, found that the Federal Railroad Administration data on train accidents and crossing incidents does not provide strong evidence that increasing train lengths correlates with safety concerns as measured by train accidents. In fact, they posited that there may even be weak evidence to the contrary, that accidents continue to decline as trains increase in length. By limiting train length, as the bill does, there will be more trains needed to move materials and finished goods. The greater number of trains will interact more with the public at crossings, potentially leading to more accidents. The Alliance for Infrastructure and Innovation report also noted that having more trains may also block crossings more often as they wait for the signal to enter rail yards or for another train ahead to clear the track or siding. With a 10,000 foot train, you're blocking off that much space, but two 5,000 foot trains, you're gonna have a buffer of 5,000 feet, so it's actually a 15,000 foot space now that's being you know, in, in the line that could block things up. Beyond increasing congestion on rail lines, more trains also means more fuel consumption and corresponding greenhouse gas emissions. As an example, the extra fuel consumption of trains limited to 7,500 feet is the equivalent of 640 Olympic-sized pools worth of wasted fuel. That's about the annual emissions of roughly 930,000 cars. And emissions would rise further if a cap on train length and the subsequent reduction in rail efficiency caused freight to to, to divert to trucks, which are significantly less fuel efficient than rail. For those reasons, we again ask you to oppose Senate File 4161, and there'll be other testifiers who can elaborate further. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Backus. Um, so we have uh, Jason Tom uh, from Union Pacific. I know I got it wrong last time, so. I'm and I can't remember how, so I'll have you introduce yourself and remind me how to pronounce your name. And then Larry Lloyd um, from Canadian Pacific, Kansas City. Welcome. Mr. Chair, committee. Good afternoon, my name is Jason Tahuli. I'm the Director of Operating Practices and Rules in Union Pacific Safety Department. Over the past four years, Union Pacific has tasked the Safety Department with many major initiatives, including reducing mainline FRA reportable derailments and blocked crossings. As a result, Union Pacific set records in both mainline reportable derailments and blocked crossing reduction in 2023. We accomplished these goals by using data and leveraging technology. Regarding derailment prevention, Union Pacific has developed Physics Train Builder, or PTB. PTB is technology that in real time simulates the physics of mass and movement, or what is referred to in the industry as in-train forces. Trains are like accordions. They expand and contract as they traverse the topography of the track. This expansion and contraction creates in-train forces known as buff and draft. Draft forces are pulling forces while buff forces are squeezing forces. If these forces are not controlled, cars can be lifted out of the train and cause a derailment. PTB calculates the in-train forces before the train ever departs and as the train is tracked across the system. If the predictive forces are beyond our tolerance limits, an alert is created and sent to either our dispatch center if the train is en route or our yard controller if the train is not departed so corrections can be made. Since the installation of PTB, Union Pacific has not experienced a single train makeup derailment or train length derailment. In conclusion, train size limitations will have no effect on derailment prevention as it will do nothing to control the physics associated with mass and motion. Managing these forces is the key to derailment prevention, not train length limitation. I thank the committee. Thank you, Mr. Tahuli. And Mr. Lloyd, thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank, yeah, thank you, Chair Deville, members of the committee. My name is Larry Lloyd. I'm with Canadian Pacific Kansas City Railway. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our concerns with uh, Senate File 4161. Safety is a core principle at CPKC, and it is foundational to everything that we do. Operating safely is fundamental to our decision making at every level of the company. It drives our disciplined operating practices, our capital investment, and our company culture. CPKC has invested consistently over in time to enable the safe and efficient operation of long trains. Our approach to capital investment is you put in the infrastructure first and then you bring on the trains that can accommodate that level of infrastructure. So since 2013, our average train lengths have increased 28%, but our train accident frequency rate has decreased 
45%, from 1.80 to less than one incident per million train miles traveled. CPKC has a sophisticated train dynamic simulation process to support train and track design. Our electronic marshalling system verifies train builds based on length, tonnage, sequencing, and routing. The assertion that trains have increased to up to 15,000 feet in many cases is not rooted in reality and is not backed up by data. CPKC limits our train length to 14,000 feet for distributed power and 10,000 feet for conventional power. Our average intercity train length is 7,609 feet, nowhere near the claim of 15,000 feet. CPKC rules for our manifest trains, trains that are made up of multiple types of freight, require speed and dynamic braking restrictions based on tonnage and operating territory. CPKC automatically monitors trains and train builds using automated simulators and continues to build out AI and algorithms to monitor their safety value. A diverse set or diverse suite of wayside detectors ensures the mechanical integrity of the equipment and active monitoring of engineer actions and operational alerts ensures the compliance to those measures. Our commitment to safe operation of longer trains doesn't, doesn't just take into account their safe building and operation though. Rather, CPKC's approach is holistic and strives to ensure minimal community impact while protecting our industry-leading Amtrak host relationship. When it comes to block crossings, we, had, we work to mitigate those through operational planning, controlled train meets, training, and dedicated operating rules. We take block crossing complaints seriously and work to address each one that we receive. CPKC has a strong relationship with Amtrak and has been its strongest whole railroad year over year, earning us, earning us an A rating for on-time performance. We are a host on a number of Amtrak services and have made commitments to increase and initiate new Amtrak services, specifically those in Minnesota, and you probably know that as the Chicago to Milwaukee to the, Twi to the Twin Cities service that's coming online later this year, which by the way will have part of the best on-time performance of any Amtrak train in the nation. CPKC's operation of longer trains clearly does not interfere with our ability to host Am to be Amtrak's host. Regardless, this legislation's negative impacts to our customers, communities, and Amtrak cannot be understated. If train lengths are arbitrarily limited, the detailed planning and data that goes into building trains to ensure that capacity is preserved will be impacted. A simple, artificial, unscientific restriction on train length will lead to an increase in the number of trains on the network, which would lead to less capacity for our customer shipments, less capacity for Amtrak, and increased congestion for all users. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 4161? All right. Um, members, questions, comments, amendments? All right. All right. Come on, Senator, since you got something. Mr. All Chair, right. All right. <laughs> you want me to ask a question? I'll ask a question. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about, you know, everybody gets frustrated sometimes when there's a train there. I think most people that I've been in Southern Minnesota, you know, understand that goods are being gone across the state because of that. But, you know, talking about the, the shorter lengths and, and talking about clean energy and things like that. So I'm assuming one train has less impact than two uh, as far as the, the new clean standards that, that Senator Dibble, you've been awfully involved with. Um, is that not or not true? I mean, I would think that one train versus two trains would be better for our environment, correct? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Definitive answer, yeah. maybe. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I was going to say, and I'll just say it now because, you know, I, you know, I was going to make some wrap-up comments after all of this is over, but we need to be moving on quickly. I think the, you know, we have another bill too, um, and I'll just say I think many valid points have been raised by the industry as well as the advocates. Um, we're laying, well, we're moving a couple of these bills over, but we're going to ultimately bring them back for an omnibus bill, and we're going to sort through some of the competing claims and see what makes sense and what doesn't. Bottom line, safety is not improving. It's getting worse. Um, so we have to figure something out. Um, so thanks. All right. Anything further on 4161? All right. Are we ready to move on to 4162? I'm sorry, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we have to we have to move this bill out to judiciary because it creates fines. Um, so, all of those in favor of Senate File 4160? Oh, who needs? Do uh, we'll have Senator Morrison move Senate File 4161 um, uh, to be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Judiciary. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. No. 
Motion carries. All right, 4162, Senator Kupik. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay, and this is, uh, weirdly, this is a railroad bill that does not deal with trains, uh, but it deals with cars. <laughs> And it deals with the, uh, specifically, uh, with the insurance uh, around those vehicles that carry the crews from point to point. So oftentimes a train crew, uh, when they get to the end of their run, that is not where they need to end up. And they need to get back, and they actually do not take a train back. They get in a vehicle and are transported back. And with that, they are transported in a vehicle um, that has been hired by the railroads to take them. Um, let you know that uh, railroad workers uh, do not have workers' compensation. So if they get hurt at work, uh, they have to sue the railroad under the Federal Employers Liability Act to prove that they did something wrong. While riding in what is, these are called deadhead vans, because you deadheaded at the end of the line and you get a ride back, uh, a motor carrier, uh, if they are struck by a drunk driver, the railroad employees would not be able to demonstrate the fault of the railroad company and would instead have to turn to the drunk driver insurance company for lost wages and medical bills. Uh, in Minnesota, the minimum insurance coverage is uh, $40,000 per person per accident, $60,000 for injuries uh, of more than two people. Uh, so for example, if three railroad employees making $75,000 a year, uh, they'd be left uh, with 20 years left to retirement age who are no longer able to work because of an accident would consume four and a half million dollars uh, before the van driver or medical bills were considered. The drunk driver uh, could be in compliance with Minnesota law but not be able to cover a fraction of the potential cost. So they're asking here to, uh, in this bill, to raise that insurance level up uh, to a higher amount uh, to cover that, and uh, if you go to, let me make sure I got the right bill, because there's been a lot of them today, uh, on 4162, uh, to raise that insurance uh, up from $1 million, uh, to $5 million. You find that on line 2.12 on page 2. Thank you, uh, Senator Kupek and Ms. Boyd. We have a fiscal note, if you could help us understand it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, uh, as with other fiscal notes today, this has to do with the um, state rail safety inspection account, the special revenue fund, um, adding penalties in the bill for, for um, other existing um, violations in statute uh, would require MnDOT uh, estimates one FTE, and that comes out to the cost of 119000 per year uh, from that special revenue fund account. And as before, um, these penalties may bring in revenues, but it is not estimated at this time. Thank you. All right. Um, we have a couple of testifiers. Mr. Kadich and Ms. Backus, please come forward. Mr. Kadich, welcome. Chair Dibble and, and committee members, uh, Nick Kadich with Smart Transportation Division. Um, so Senate Final... 4162 is pretty straightforward, or, or so I think, um, and I'm here to testify in favor. Minnesota Statute 221.0255 is a great law protecting railroad workers. Uh, some railroads have been voluntarily encouraged into compliance over its 14-year history, but others boldly claim Minnesota law does not apply to them. This bill adds enforcement penalties to the existing law in order to compel compliance from the still offending railroad companies and raises a minimum insurance requirement to a more modern number. So railroad crews actually spend a lot of time in deadhead transportation on Minnesota highways, uh, more than most people outside the industry realize. This usually involves a railroad subcontracted crew hauling company. So as the railroads moved away from employing their own staff and vehicles to transport train crews, this statute became necessary to set a st safety standard for what these contracted vehicles needed to be and the insurance requirements they needed to carry. So as mentioned, railroad workers are not covered by worker compensation laws. They are part of the Federal Employers Liability Act, which is a fault-based system. So the injured employee must uh, sue the railroad and prove negligence uh, on the railroad's part to claim anything. So, so unlike workers' comp, if the railroad employee is injured at work and the railroad didn't do anything wrong, the employee is entitled to nothing. So this is why underinsured and uninsured motorist coverage is important to us. With the uh, the math problem that Senator Kupek laid out, that makes it that makes it fairly clear 
um, how fast the state minimums can be absorbed in the event of a crew van accident where, um, for in this example, the drunk driver maybe didn't have insurance, uh, the van driver did nothing wrong, the railroad isn't at fault. The only recourse of the rail crew um, is to come back at this uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage uh, to finish out the rest of their lives. You know, in, in, in one extreme example, we might have uh, three people in there in their early 20s with 40 years left to work and looking at 120 years worth of compensation for these people to get them to retirement age. Uh, so this is, this is a real deal and this is, this is very important to us to protect our members uh, when they're riding with these subcontractors. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cater. Ms. Backus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Amber Backus with the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association and super excited to talk about insurance with you all. So uh, we'll change the pace here. Um, so as has been articulated, many of our railroads, both the class ones and the short lines, use van services to transport crews to and from their job locations. And the amendment before you will make it almost impossible for these van services to find coverage. We're not aware of any policies in the marketplace that write $5 million for uninsured, underinsured policies. In fact, the standard policy is $50,000 per incident for passengers and things like other transportation services. And the existing crew van law that's being amended here already requires $1 million in coverage for this category. That's 20 times more than for any other passenger policies. And it's not just me saying this, I do have a letter from the Insurance Federation of Minnesota in your packets that corroborates this. Meanwhile, federal and state law, so if uh, there was a 15 passenger van that was carrying anybody else in Minnesota besides a railroad crew. The requirement is $1.5 million in total financial responsibility. The existing crew van law being amended by the A1 is $6 million in total coverage. And with this um, bill, excuse me, the A1 was in the house, not here, uh, but this bill takes that total number to $10 million. So we're already way above what any other um, passenger van requirements are for moving people. And a little confused about the public public policy rationale behind mandating extra insurance coverage for passengers based on their profession, especially since railroad employees have access to numer numerous other insurance benefits the average Minnesota does not. Um, Felix was mentioned, and th if they are successful with their claims, those aren't capped. Off-track vehicle benefits provide up to $300,000 in coverage if injuries were sustained in a crew van. Um, there are health insurance benefits through the National Collective Bargaining Agreement that are more favorable than most Minnesotans, Minnesotans have access to. And and the United States Railroad Retirement Board benefits, which provide benefits for up to 90 days following an accident. And I only mention all these things because it's my understanding all of all the sources, all these sources of funds would need to be exhausted before that uninsured, underinsured coverage comes into play, making the need for a $5 million policy even more unreasonable. So with that, I will conclude my remarks and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Backus. Would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 4162? All right. Um, I'll just make a quick comment. Um, we're going to send this to Commerce where we can sort through some of the insurance issues. Um, probably what gets my attention more, um, you know, is the testimony around the kind of vehicles um, and, the, and, the, and the inherent safety in the, in the kinds of vehicles that are sent uh, to bring folks back home um, or, you know, or to their destinations to and from work. Um, you know, and, and if in fact it's true that um, inappropriate kinds of vehicles without any, uh, uh, with, you know, with the ability to secure luggage and, and things like that, um, you know, that, that, that is, is really an issue that I'd, I'd like to resolve. The insurance stuff, not our bailiwick necessarily. I'll let Commerce worry about that. Um, but, you know, would like to see more compliance with making sure the appropriate kinds of vehicles are being used to deadhead the employees back and forth. All right. Um, questions, comments, amendments? Senator Jasinski. No, Mr. Chair, just I'd not go on in a long one here, but just to, my concern is, again, if the $5 million policy is very difficult to obtain, it's, it's going to be cumbersome on these uh, railroads to do that. And if there's, from what I'm hearing, it's very difficult to get that. And I haven't heard of those limits for any other activity. I don't know what a, you know, a shuttle van service is. And I think Ms. Backus might have those numbers. Did you say it's rolls up? So, for example, if it's, if it's another industry and they're in a van, they're coming back, what's the max limit that they're, or the, the minimum they're required? It's a million dollars, correct? It's $1.5 million, and that's total financial responsibility. It's not just one kind of coverage. That's everything combined. Okay. So 1.5, and we're going from 1 million to 5 million. It seems a little excessive to me. Uh, so that's just my only comment. I'll let Commerce talk about it, but uh, just be a concern again. You know, I know railroads, uh, you know, 
you talk about record profits and profits, but think of the investment they have. So obviously the higher the risk, the higher the, the involvement, the more capital expenses, uh, they're going to make more money, so they're going to be successful. And, and that's a successful business to, to penalize them just because they're successful by increasing these things, I think is just detrimental to our industry of what's going on out there. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. All right, uh, Senator Kupek, anything further? Last word. All right. No, I'd love to go to Commerce. All right. <laughs> Senator McEwen uh, moved Senate File 4162 to be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Commerce. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. That concludes our business. We did pretty good. Committee 515. Um, and so, uh, Ms. Ether, any announcements? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our uh, agenda for Monday has been posted, um, and it includes uh, an expansion of the capital area security uh, complex that would include the new space being used by the state office building users next year, and um, motorcycle lights and some other exciting bills. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us on Monday. All right. With that, we are adjourned.